water worlds of our solar system with Olivier Vitasse, Juice Project Scientist, European Space Agency. Welcome back to The Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week we're exploring water worlds of our solar system, talking with Olivier Vatas from the European Space Agency, project scientist for the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, or JUICE, now on its way to the Jovian system. There it goes. Welcome to Luna City Spaceport. Flight 22 to Mars is now boarding at gate C5. Gravity generators are down in Sector 9. We remind you to not feed the space monkeys. They are wild animals and may bite or scratch you. Join me, your trusty celestial tour guide, as we don our intellectual swim trunks and dive into the water worlds of our solar system. Now, water, essential for all life on Earth, was once thought to be rare in the solar system. Uh, large quantities of water ice are now believed to sit inside dark craters at the poles of the moon where sunlight never strikes. Ice deposits at the south pole of the moon alone could hold as much as 150 times as much water as the Mediterranean Sea. And these vast deposits of water here mean these regions are where the first human settlements on the moon will soon rise. But native life on the moon seems unlikely inside huge blocks of solid ice billions of years old. Shows what you know. I live in the coolest neighborhood in the solar system. Okay. Mars was likely once home to massive oceans, but now water on this world is thought to be restricted to thimble-sized deposits buried a couple of meters beneath its ruddy surface. Although microbial life might exist in these tiny abodes, you really can't do much chemistry in a thimble. What is wrong with this guy? Seriously? I've raised over 674,000 children in this thimble, and they turned out just fine. Next up is the king of the planets of the 80 to 95 known moons of Jupiter. Three are now believed to house vast oceans of liquid water. Callisto is the most heavily cratered object in our solar system. Once thought to be a dead body, evidence for subsurface oceans was first spotted by the Galileo spacecraft in the 1990s. The same craft also found an atmosphere of carbon dioxide similar to the one in Isaac Asimov's story, The Calliston Menace. Unlike that story, however, giant caterpillars were nowhere to be seen. Dude, I'm right here. Hello, giant caterpillar. Come on. Ganymede is larger than the planet Mercury, and it is the only moon known to have its own magnetic field. This behemoth world could also be home to the largest ocean in our family of planets. Bodies of water on Ganymede stretch 10 times deeper than Earth, buried under 150 kilometers of ice. That's five times deeper than the average crust of Earth here on terra firma. These massive oceans might also be sandwiched between layers of mineral-rich rock greatly increasing the amount of chemistry happening at the boundaries between water and rock where life on Earth first took hold. Get your Europa sandwich right here. We got rocks. We got water. We got little green stuff squirming around in there. And slime. Extra slime. Also, pickles. You gross and disgusting. I say no thanks. And who eats a sandwich with pickles? Europa with an iron core, rocking mantle, and an ocean of salty water. Sound familiar? Maybe the best place in the solar system to search for extraterrestrial life. Oceans here could hold twice as much water as they spend on Earth. Now the surface of this world is covered in water ice bent and pulled by tidal forces due to gravity from Jupiter. This action breaks apart the icy surface and it cracks apart from stress like every couple by the end of a Paul Simon song. 
Heat from this process might also help warm the oceans of Europa, increasing hopes of finding of extraterrestrial life which formed beyond our home planet. On the 14th of April, the Jupiter Icy Moon's Explorer spacecraft, lovingly known as JUICE, lifted off on its way to explore these intriguing moons of Jupiter. Next up, we talk with Olivier Vitas from the European Space Agency, project scientist for JUICE. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by Olivier Vitas. He is a Jews project scientist for JUICE uh, with the European Space Agency and he's here to talk to us today about the JUICE program and the icy moons of Jupiter. Welcome to the show, Olivier. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. So uh, just for those who may not know, can you just first of all give us a brief introduction uh, to the JUICE program and what it is that you hope to accomplish? Yeah, so the it's a, the juice uh, means a uh, Jupiter icy moon explorer. So it's a mission, as the name uh, suggests, to explore Jupiter and three of the of the moons around Jupiter, which are uh, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede. It's very they are very interesting moons because we think there is a lot of liquid water underneath their surfaces, and liquid water is an ingredient for life so that means uh juice will will try to answer a lot of very uh, very interesting questions the mission was launched uh on the 14th of april so last month from french guiana the project started more than 10 years ago we are really in the middle of the project we are because ahead of us we have eight years of cruise to jupiter it takes some time to go to jupiter and then we have four five six years of mission so we have still a lot to do uh, we just passed the most critical moment, which is the launch, because it's al always always a scary moment. Mm -hmm. And now we are preparing for the cruise, and uh, we have eight years to prepare the, the science phase to learn more about Jupiter and the fascinating moons around Jupiter. Yeah, and you guys get to take a little tour of the inner solar system, don't you, on the way there? Yes, yes because the, the spacecraft is relatively heavy. I mean, it's a big spacecraft. You have an image uh, be behind you. It's six tons at launch. Uh, more than half of the weight is due to fuel propellant because we have a lot of maneuvers to, to make in the solar system and around Jupiter. And we launch with Ariane 5, which is a great rocket, mm. but not powerful enough to send us directly to Jupiter. So we need a bit of help. And the help will come from gravity assist uh, flying by planets like uh, Earth and Venus to get a little bit more speed to be able to reach Jupiter. So all in all, it takes eight years, while the direct route will be only uh, three years. Mm. And are you going to be able to do either any science or at least take a couple of pretty pictures of the Earth-Moon system or Venus on the way by? Uh, yes, no, we were doing the eight years. We are not going to do nothing, of course, and to sleep until we arrive there. So the, doing the flybys of, of the planet, so uh, Moon, Earth, and Venus, we will do a little bit of uh, operations with our instrument. Of course, we take pictures, do some measurement. It's always good to uh, to do some science. We'll do a little bit of science, so also doing the cruise phase, like measuring the solar wind, uh, the dust in the, in the in the inner solar system. Uh, twice per year, we'll be checking the, the instrument to make sure that everything is fine. So there will be a lot of operation from, from time to time, but the main, the main mission will start something like six months before arriving at Jupiter, so in early 2031. Mm. And once you get there, you know, of course, 
the three big targets, you know, are Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa, uh, which we've talked a little bit on this episode. But um, can you give us a brief intro into into the into what we know about the oceans and on those worlds and how they might compare to the oceans on Earth. Yeah, so they they are very interesting moons, so Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, and they are very different uh, because their size is different. I mean, uh, we have the biggest moon, which is uh, Ganymede. Callisto is also very big. Europa is uh, much smaller, so we have, the size is different, and their distance to Jupiter is different. Europa is much closer, and then we have Ganymede and Callisto. So the combination of the size and the distance to Jupiter makes that those three moons are very different. So Europa is a relatively active moon. So the surface is very young. So there is a lot of resurfacing. Uh, we think that there is a, a lot of liquid water which is in contact with the rocks inside the Europa. So it makes uh, this ocean very interesting for the study of habitability and possibly life. Mm. So it's, it's, a, it's a kind of active moon. So very interesting. Then we have the two others, which are Ganymede and Callisto. So Callisto is a much further away from, from Jupiter. When you look at the surface, it's many, many craters. So the surface is very old, has not evolved at all. So it's like a dead moon, like our own moon. So we have a, a, an active moon, Europa, a dead moon, Callisto, and in between, Ganymede. So that makes the three moons very interesting to study because there are different stages of, of evolution. But the three uh, harbors liquid ocean and maybe in more quantity than on earth we think that for example on ganymede there is maybe six times more liquid water than on earth so that makes those worlds quite fascinating mm. of course they are very deep underneath the surface for ganymede it's maybe at 100 kilometers underneath the surface uh, but we need to know more how much water where is it exactly what is the composition to see if those worlds could be uh, potentially habitable uh, that means if there are some interesting conditions for life. And if the answer is yes, then there will be another mission to know more about it because juice will not detect life for sure. But at least we'll know more about liquid water somewhere else in the solar system. Hmm. And uh, as I understand it, juice has 10 main instruments on board. Can you give us just a look at maybe a couple of the more interesting, fascinating Oh, they are, they, are all, they are all very interesting. So we have four instruments in, in a group that we call remote sensing, so that the cameras, spectrometers to take images, to know what's going on. Of course, to take beautiful images of uh, Jupiter and, and the icy moons. And what we call spectrometers is to get images, but as a function of wavelength, so uh, infrared, ultraviolet, to know more about the composition of the surfaces and of the atmospheres of Jupiter and the moons. Then we have what we call a group of in situ, so they will measure locally what's going on around the spacecraft, like a magnetic field, electric field, particles, electrons, protons, because the radiation environment of Jupiter is quite complex. There is a strong radiation belt due to the, to the huge field of, of Jupiter. And then we have a group of instruments called geophysics, like with a laser altimeter, uh, a radar, to know more about the interior of the moon, because it's very important to understand their interior structure. Uh, for example, on Ganymede, we think there is a, a iron core which generates its own magnetic field. It's a unique feature in the solar system, the only moon to generate a magnetic field. We don't know why it's that and what is the role of this magnetic field. So we, know, we need to know the interior structure of the moon to understand them, them better. And you also um, hope to get um, more knowledge and learn more about Jupiter itself, don't you? Yeah, because of course the focus is the, the icy moons and Ganymede. But since we are around Jupiter, we don't we don't forget Jupiter and it's a very fascinating planet with a huge planet with the atmosphere. We want to study the climate and the magnetosphere of Jupiter, so the huge magnetic field. And it's quite interesting if we want to study the moons, we need to study the environment. Why do we have those uh, properties of the moon around a planet like Jupiter. What is the link between the moons and Jupiter? And there are two uh, links that we would like to understand better. We have the gravitational link uh, because Jupiter is a big planet. And as a result, uh, we have what we call tides on the surfaces of the moon, like our tide on the on the on Earth due to the moon. That's why we have the 
the tides on the ocean. And we have the same on the icy moons. The, the shape of the moon vary with time. It's like a rugby ball. And this is uh, why probably those moons are active and are heated in their interior and that uh, ice melt and produce liquid water. So it's very important to understand the gravitational link between Jupiter and the moons. And there is another link, which is the magnetic link, because we have a huge magnetic field at Jupiter. So we, we have to, to, um, uh, to think that there are some magnetic field lines which are invisible, of course. But the magnetic field line, they link the planet and the moons. And we have some particles which travel from the moon to Jupiter, like electrons, proton, energetic particles, and they produce aurora or northern light, as, as we see on, on the Earth, the aurora uh, on the north and on the south. We have similar processes at Jupiter. So there is a link between the moons and Jupiter, and we would like to understand that better to, to see whether around a planet like Jupiter, there are some habitable places. So we need to study everything, Jupiter, the moons, the other moons, uh, the dust. So uh, we'll have a complete picture of the Jupiter system. Hmm. And it sounds like there's so much great science that's going to come out uh, from JUICE. And as you're looking at, at its data, as it's coming in, um, obviously, you know, you're not going to probably not going to see direct evidence of life. But, um, but you're likely to get uh, some sort of evidence that might suggest that it was there. Is that correct? And what might be uh, life? We we cannot detect, of course, because it's always complicated to uh, right. to detect to de detect life. We need to have the proper definition on life, and we need to have the proper instrumentation. And to detect life, I mean, to detect life, you need to go to go there to land on the surface, maybe to drill inside the moon. Uh, so it's already quite complicated at Mars. <laughs> So on the icy moon, it's much more complicated. So we are not going to detect life, but uh, with our instrumentation, we are going to detect the liquid water. And that's very important because if we find interesting properties of this liquid ocean, then we can say something about potential life. That's one thing. And then there will be uh, also the, our spectrometers so or our cameras are equipped also to, uh, to detect uh, the composition of the surface, for example, ices, uh, minerals, organic materials. Mm -hmm. If you look at the at the Europa moon, there are a lot of different colors on the surface. Uh, for example, orange, uh, and we don't know what this material is about. <laughs> it can be organic molecules, which can be interesting for life. So uh, by mapping the surface uh, uh, and finding interesting molecules like salt, minerals, you will know better about the environment and whether the environment is suitable for life. And at Europa, there is a, something which is quite interesting is uh, we call that geysers of plumes. Uh, they have been detected by Earth-based uh, telescopes like Hubble. There is still a debate whether they are true, but if it's true, that means something uh, coming from the interior, from the ocean of Europa is escaping space, like water vapor and molecules, and we can detect that with juice by flying fly by around those moons. And then you have direct access to what is in the interior. So we have many ways of, uh, of uh, finding interesting results which are related to, to possible uh, life. Hmm. And speaking of Europa, of course, um, by the time that juice gets to Jupiter, we should have the Europa Clipper. Correct. In the Jovian system there as well. Can you tell us a little bit about how JUICE might work with uh, the Europa Clipper and vice versa to yep. help uncover? Yeah, in fact, uh, we will work with Europa Clipper. We are, we are very happy to have uh, two spacecraft at the same time in, this, in the Jupiter system. I think it's a great opportunity. People are very happy about that, very excited. The good thing is that we are not in competition because Europa Clipper is more focused on Europa. And we are focused on the rest. So the, the other moons, so Ganymede, Callisto, Jupiter, Io, and so on. So we, there is no uh, uh, a big competition between the two missions, which is good. It will be a bit, right. a, a bit, a bit silly to send two missions with the same goal at the same time. So that's one thing. And then uh, the two science teams, they are working very well together. We have a regular contact. So we are already working together to have a plan 
to see how we can uh, best use two satellites at the same time to make joint, co joint measurement when we are close to each other. Mm -hmm. For example, there is one flyby of Europa uh, and Juice and Clipper will be separated by only four hours. So that means more or less at the same time, the two, the two spacecraft will be at Europa and do similar measurements. So that's good to compare, right. to see what's going on. So it's one example. But we have also other example that uh, when one spacecraft is around the moon, the other spacecraft is somewhere else. So one spacecraft can make measurement around the moon and the other can look at Jupiter, what's going on. Hmm. For example, the aurora generated by the moon. And that's this kind of observation that we can do together. Uh, and so we are very excited by that. And uh, we have also uh, other ideas like um, at the end of the mission, the spacecraft will probably collide into Ganymede mm -hmm. because we need to end the mission with a, with a certain end. And for JUICE, we'll, we'll impact Ganymede. And for Europa Clipper, it's a possible end of the mission. And it's always interesting to witness an impact on the surface because you can excavate a little bit of ice, make a crater, see what's going on. So if one spacecraft is impacting Ganymede at high speed, the other one can take images at the same time. That's a, uh, a very unique opportunity to know more about the, what is underneath the, the surface. So we have a lot of, uh, of good ideas, I think, uh, and a lot of motivation. So I think it's great to have really these two, two, two spacecraft at the same time. So we are very happy about it. Absolutely. And finally, what can the what can the JUICE mission, uh, looking at ice, studying icy moons, teach us about uh, exoplanets? So yes, so uh, because Jup the, the Jupiter system, it's a very complex system with many, many moons, so more than 90 moons, plus dust. So it's a, it's a small solar system in a, in a way. So by studying a small solar system, you can first understand better our own solar system. So how the solar system uh, were born, how it evolved with time, because the picture that we have now is not the same four billion years ago. Mm -hmm. So if you understand a system like Jupiter, you can better understand our own solar system. And in addition, uh, because many ex extra solar system looks like uh, Jupiter, uh, you can, uh, what you learn about the Jupiter system, you can uh, adapt that or, or uh, use that to learn more about extrasolar system. It's, it's one example of an extrasolar system with a lot of complexity. So, mm. uh, so that's why it's, uh, it's very useful to understand other, other uh, extrasolar system. There might be uh, moons, including liquid water in, in, in exoplanet. Uh, the, 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 the properties of, of Ganymede is very interesting because there is a magnetic field at Ganymede embedded into the big magnetic field of uh, Jupiter. And you have a strange magnetic field generated by the liquid ocean, which is salty. So in terms of magnetic field, magnetic processes, you have a very weird laboratory and you can use that also to learn uh, about extrasolar system because uh, this kind of laboratory will be useful to understand other, other system because it's a very extreme, extreme case. So, uh, yes, we are very uh, happy to provide that also for, for the exoplanet uh, community. I think it will be very interesting. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Olivier. It was a pleasure talking with you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for, for your interest. And uh, keep, uh, keep watching us. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, that was uh, Olivier Vitas, a uh, Juice Project Scientist at the European Space Agency. Next up, we head on out to the ringed planet. Now, after staring at Saturn's rings mouth agape for 22 minutes, like James Kirk first seeing the Enterprise in Star Trek The Motion Picture, we turn our sights to two intriguing worlds, Titan and Enceladus. Titan is best known for having massive oceans of methane and ethane on its surface. However, beneath its crust might also lie oceans of liquid water. With hydrocarbons, organic materials, mineral-rich rocks, and water, 
Titan could be home to some intriguing chemistry and perhaps even bizarre forms of life. Enceladus may be small, but it is the old faithful of our solar system, spewing forth geysers of water thousands of kilometers in the space. These plumes, recently imaged by the James Webb Space Telescope, are infused with the chemical building blocks of life. Whipping around Saturn once every 33 hours, these eruptions from Enceladus form a giant donut of water encircling the planet. Mmm, giant water donut. <laughs> oh, you like geysers, you say? Well, I happen to know where to find some more. What? No, no, not Yellowstone. Well, kind of, but... You know what? Just, just follow me. Okay, here we are at the most distant, full-fledged planet in the solar system. We should think. Neptune. See its largest moon? Yeah, that troublemaker orbiting in the opposite direction from all the other satellites here. Yeah, 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 that's Triton. Now, it's wet and cold on Triton. Minus 235 Celsius on average. Pretty much the exact opposite of Arizona. Hey, at least it's a wet cold dare, mm -hmm. don't Chano. The surface of Triton is covered in active geysers pushing nitrogen gas into space. This home, this world is home to smooth volcanic plains and pits formed by flows of icy lava, a process known as cryovolcanism. Uh, volcanoes of mineral-rich water on, tr on Triton turn the landscape into a cross between ancient Pompeii and frozen. Finally, we zoom out to the Kuiper Belt, paying a visit to the dwarf planet with a heart, Pluto. Beneath its rocky crust, Pluto is now thought to house a global ocean, which may be 100 kilometers or more than 11 Mount Everest deep. Despite the frigid temperatures this far from the sun, stress from tidal forces between Pluto and its largest moon, Sharon, could keep these oceans warm enough to remain liquid and perhaps even provide enough energy to spark life. Each of these water worlds provides intriguing landscapes, along with geology, chemistry, and physics, which could offer us the greatest finding of all time, the discovery of life on other worlds. Next week on the Cosmic Companion, we're going to take a look at efforts to at coding the universe. How do we recreate the universe in computer simulations? And how will artificial intelligence revolutionize our understanding of the cosmos? We will be joined by cosmologist Andrew Ponson, author of The Universe in a Box. Make sure to join us starting on the 17th of June. Head on over to thecosmiccompanion.com and sign up for our newsletter and never miss an episode. If you love your science shows informative, entertaining, and at least occasionally funny, where, where can I find a show like that? That sounds great! What? Oh. Oh, The Cosmic Companion. Yeah, right. Uh, you could share and follow us and let your friends know about the show. All right? Thanks! Clear skies. But the water is it's cold. Or oh, jump on in. The water's fine once you get used to it. <laughs>